Hi, everybody. I'm John Graffman, Executive Director of Auto Designo. Thank you for coming to Cars of Character. I'm Joni Gray, President of the Motor Press Guild. Welcome, everyone, to the Cars of Character. Of course, Auto Designo has done this event several years now, um, many times through the auspices of the Motor Press Guild, but this year kind of took it on their own, so I'm here to support them. Hopefully, there's some MPG members in the audience. Yay! <laughs> Auto Designo, on behalf of them, they would like to thank the featured design sponsors who are BMW, GM, Hyundai, and Mazda. Before I bring 3D Excite up, I just want to thank them. Uh, we also want to thank Catskin Automotive Leather, Eric Noble and the Car Lab, and News Press USA, Charmaine Joie, a couture, which uh, had done a lot of the decorations around here, and Charmaine J. Rodriguez for the display of beautiful fashions and models. And a special thanks to Jean Chang for coordinating assistance, Matt Bernal of Bernal Auto Style Graphics, the Motor Press Guild, and Warner Brothers Studios. So right now, I want to bring up Gary Griffith. He's going to do a quick presentation, and he's from 3D Excite. Please welcome. Good evening. I am Gary Griffith. I work for 3D Excite. Uh, for those of you that don't recognize that name, you may remember us as RTT. Uh, we are a visualization company, um, and we are very proud to be here sponsoring this event. Uh, and thank you, Auto Designo, for allowing us to participate. Hopefully you guys had a good time out there checking out the cars and, and uh, meeting each other and uh, just gathering with your peers. Instead of me telling you what 3D Excite does, I think it's really good just to show you and kind of get some, uh, some energy going in the room and, and, uh, and let you guys see what we do. I'd like to say, isn't it cool we all work in an industry where that kind of stuff can happen uh, and that, you, that, that all of us get to use our creative juices and, and make stuff cool like that every day. I have to admit, that's the largest screen I've ever seen our showreel on and it kind of blew me away. So uh, hopefully that was good for you guys too. Uh, one other thing I'd like to comment on, you might have seen there at the end, uh, uh, 3D Excite is now part of Dassault Systems. Um, you know, Dassault Systems is a big company, but we at 3D Excite still maintain our small company attitude, our creative uh, approach to doing business. Uh, we'd be happy to tell you more about what we do. Um, and uh, if you didn't already look at some of the booths outside, they may still be open when you walk out or find somebody from 3D Excite like myself or others. There's some of my peers are here and we'd be happy to talk to you. I'm just going to introduce our panel. They can come on up as I introduce you. Chris Chapman from Hyundai. <laughs> Frank Saucedo from GM. Lawrence Schaefer from BMW, and Derek Jenkins from Mazda. I also want to introduce our moderator today, Eric Noble. He's the president of Car Lab. And as a journalist and with all of our journalist friends, he's one of the most quotable analysts in the automotive industry. And now, as all of us try to you know, figure out what is the best design? What makes a car of character? This, he is someone who works with designers, who works with product people, who are doing these great designs that we love to write about and listen to. So without further ado, take it away, Eric. Thank you. One bit of further ado, actually, um, which is very, very important. Um, we've got a special announcement um, that affects everybody who's viewing this here in person. This will be available on video later. So see Auto Designo for the video. We've got a great crew here tonight, so there'll be a link for that. But in the meantime, for those of you that are here in person, there's a very important Catskin announcement, Yes, right? I forgot. <laughs> I forgot it. Um, I'd like to bring uh, Dara up, Dara Ward from Catskin. Uh, Catskin Automotive Leather, we're, we're an aftermarket company constantly inspired by what you gentlemen do and making sure that 
the uh, personality of the interior really fits the, the, uh, the car. And sometimes consumers want to buy a car that, of their dreams and they can't quite afford leather, so we kind of make that an affordable luxury to them in a cloth vehicle. We do about 130,000 interiors in a year. Thanks again to, uh, to Catskin and, uh, and our sponsors. This would not be happening without them. And I think more importantly, we all owe a very, very big thanks to John Grafman. And I think that applause is going to be bigger now than it will be after the panel. This event, we're, we're you know, half a decade's worth, and really that is John Grafman. John, it's John's passion and John's energy and John's knowledge of the business that makes this thing happen, and it's why we're all here tonight. So, John, thank you very much. Um, I, I want to get into um, these gentlemen talking about design, and um, it's not going to be a hermetical conversation if we're doing this right, um, nor will it be a chance for them to spear each other's work. Um, but I we want to talk about cars of character. We are at Warner Brothers. Um, the entertainment industry is an awfully big part of, of our Southern California larger design culture. And so we'll talk a little bit about cars that actually are characters. But I think more importantly and more broadly than that, um, those of us that love cars and many of, many of the consumers that do personify or we, we project persona onto our cars. And if we do this correctly from a design standpoint, we can guide the sort of persona that they perceive. And so tonight we want to talk about cars that have persona, how that's generated, and how that's evolving over time with four very important studios and their leaders. So normally we would start off by asking um, anyone except Frank to tell us how they fell in love um, with, <laughs> with cars, because Frank would, in about 27 minutes, we'd be at the Myers Manx. <laughs> so. <laughs> What, what I'm going to do instead is we're going to pull up some images. There are two images, one of uh, uh, two two images per studio, and I want each of these design leaders to talk about two things about that about those vehicles. One is what they were trying to achieve, right? What they were trying to project, and second, um, their studios and their own role in that work. So, without further ado, if I'm if I'm working this remote correctly. We have this car, and so we'll, we'll pick on you first, Stefan, and can you tell us what we're looking at? It's a one-to-one -one scale clay, it looks right. All right. So um, this is a car that is actually just introduced in the, in the U.S. market. This is a, an X6, and uh, this was designed here in California in our studio. Um, actually by a designer who transitions back and forth quite a bit between the different uh, topic fields of design. This is a guy who uh, designs in between product design, transportation design, automotive design, and meanders quite a bit and brings a bit of his knowledge from these different disciplines to the table on uh, this product here. This is a hugely successful product for BMW. Um, the, uh, these types of, of uh, uh, products here have uh, in, in our minds built a big uh, foundation in the understanding of what a sports activity vehicle with a sporty silhouette can look like. And they have a huge transition, uh, tradition obviously with BMW in the meantime. They're uh, scaled up and down into different uh, segments as well. And this is uh, the true uh, and, and uh, important successor of the original X6. Okay. And in this image here we're looking at? This is uh, a Grand Coupe uh, 4 Series that is um, also um, on the market since only a very short uh, amount of time. Also very much a statement for sportiness and elegance in that type of a combination. Um, nice sculptural statement, uh, enormously driver-focused car as well. And I think something that fits uh, extremely well actually uh, here for California. This second vehicle also touched by your team? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. The, uh, uh, the way that we are, we are working is that uh, in our studios here in California in Shanghai, which is a second uh, studio that we are uh, running and a studio in Munich that is outside of the BMW infrastructure, we are doing competitive uh, concepts to the internal design department at uh, BMW Design. And the, the topic there is uh, fresh impulses that are inspired from, from different uh, contexts, different viewpoints from uh, different marketplace uh, places. And uh, with it, we are always trying to do statements that are stretching the boundaries of what BMW would do internally. And um, I guess both of these products, the X6 and this one here, are, are very typical statements of how this could look like. 
Thank you. Some, some nice work and plenty of Dynock and a lot of time in that <laughs> surface, so thank you. Um, the next image will call the player, and in this case, Frank, I think that's you. Yeah, I guess it is. Um, this cat, El Mirage, which it was outside, so this was blatant that we uh, brought the slide with us, but uh, um, our studio's actually located walking distance from here almost. We're just here in uh, North Hollywood, Burbank area. Um, and, you know, the goal of our studio is actually to set visions for all four brands of General Motors, and we work on all four brands. In this case, this was part of a trilogy that we were doing. The first car was a CO, which was launched at uh, Pebble Beach uh, two years before this, and then this was launched last year. Um, and again, for us, it was the studio's opportunity to actually tar start to create a vision for Cadillac um, where it's going. It's come a long way. We have great product, but, you know, he said, what if you were to do uh, American elegance again and in a bigger scale because it was one of the interesting thing people said when we did the CL was you finally did a big car you know and it's, you're not chasing the Europeans you're doing what's natural for an American car company so that led us to, to do the El Mirage and then there it will be a third car hopefully and uh, mm -hmm. and it'll be the third in the trilogy and again what our studio actually does is that we work on some pre-production but we do a lot of vision work for the brands. And this, for us, has been a, a five-year journey. And is that because you're buying time until they finally have a platform for this? Uh, no, because we do. <laughs> <laughs> I think this is the interior. Yes, it is. Um, and again, too, again, another opportunity for us, because we started out with the CL to do something different with the interior, where we're merging the technology and the, the big black screens, as we like to call them, internally and with analog. So how do you get the analog and the digital mix together where it creates, you know, jewelry? And um, Gail Bazan, who's our lead interior designer and, and was the lead interior, interior designer on this vehicle, um, you know, he wanted to create a luxury space and Cadillac has a very strong presence today, but we were asked to do something to take it to the next level. Where could we possibly go uh, with Cadillac? And um, the year before, the two years before we did the CL, the whole interior was done. All the wood on it was done out of Italian uh, olive, solid olive. We milled solid olive, which was the craziest thing we've ever done. Um, so planks of wood that we did photogrammetry on and blended it onto data, and then we milled it out. So it was crazy. This one we tried a little bit different, and we did uh, a veneer that we'd never used before, and we wanted to actually move the grain in the same pattern as the interior. So if you look carefully, all the grain moves with the motion of the interior. And it was Gail's concept to do this, and at first we're like, well, how do we do this? But with some help through uh, some very creative team back in Detroit, they were able to build this. And well, again, it's another item that's bespoke that your hand touches that sets the mood for Cadillac. Um, yeah, so a li little bit like these gentlemen, we have a design studio in, in Irvine, California. It's also coupled with our R&D group um, for North America and a similar uh, circumstance where we, we compete with our colleagues in Japan as well as our sister studio in uh, Frankfurt, Germany on design programs. Um, in the case of this project, it was uh, all hands on deck, as you can imagine, because it was a huge uh, undertaking to kind of take on what, what we consider to be kind of the Mazda brand icon and really the soul of the company kind of representing uh, driving exhilaration, fun to drive, and all the things that Mazda as a brand really tries to stand for, and uh, was kind of epitomized in, with the first car in 89. So uh, when this opportunity came up, you know, we, we took it very seriously um, and very, in a very focused way, but we also felt um, from, a, from a regional standpoint, we really had to communicate kind of uh, where the car's image was currently back to Japan. And I think that, that was probably our biggest role in this project, really kind of letting them know that there's people that truly love this car and it has a following, but at the same time, it needs a dramatic refresh if we really want it to survive, especially in the enthusiast minds going forward in the future. They just thought the sales figures were missing a zero. Well, that's the thing, you know, it's like if you literally look at the numbers, as much as people say they love the car, actually it's been in dramatic decline throughout its life cycle. So if you look at other iconic sports cars, actually the trend is different. So we knew that something had to change, you know, and I think a lot of that is just simply the character of the car. Um, 
another point is just uh, kind of how the car is <coughs> positioned in, in the marketplace. Is it just purely a driving car, or can it be more? Can it be more aspirational? Our studio, um, very talented designer, uh, Julia Montuse, which I'm proud to say I stole from Frank. Um, I have did, all the French did, designers. Did the say? interior design. <laughs> And, uh, you know, our studio led that all the way through to the end and, and um, really kind of represents the next big step for our, our uh, approach to interiors. Still keeping driver focus, but, but really kind of evolving out of this kind of uh, plastic feeling that's typically seen in, in this level of car. Yeah. If uh, history repeats itself, he'll be on to Tesla soon. Careful now. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Chapman. Yeah, this is the uh, show car that we unveiled a couple of years ago at Detroit, the HCD14. It's sort of the Genesis limousine concept that was the teaser concept before the production car came out. What do you, what do you mean by teaser concept? Well, you know, we want, we want to show the next level of, of luxury for Hyundai. And we were pretty successful with the, with the Genesis name, the Genesis cars that have been on the road. That they've been looked upon pretty favorably by by our, our customers. And uh, we also have a pretty strong sort of design language that seem, seems to be resonating really well with, with the customers as well. So we wanted to show sort of maybe the next step in what we're trying to say with regard to what we call fluidic sculpture at Hyundai, um, but in a more refined way, a simplified way, mm -hmm. and uh, try to bring across the idea that you can be somehow still sensual and dramatic and, and, and assertive, but with uh, not so much design content, or if you will, lines everywhere, shapes everywhere, graphics everywhere, but actually try to remove things to the point where once you remove one more element, then it becomes something else. So it's kind of like design 101 in a way. And what we want to try to do is show something in as minimalistic a form as possible to try and, to bring And chronologically, this, this show car yeah. was created effectively after the, the production car tooling was locked? Yeah, it was, it was kind of in between, really. It was really just kind of, um, sometimes you break off the, 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 the forms and the graphics and the, and the clay uh, model away from the production car to sort of uh, create a fork in the road or a parallel road that goes along with it that can sort of be the essence or the expression of the car that's going to come out in production because you don't want to necessarily um, literally show the, the, the unveiling of a production car. Is it an amplification of the language of the production car? Yeah, I think so. I think it can be, it's a, character, a characterization, really, uh, of the essence of the car, I think. I think this should be the interior of it. Yeah, and the, the interior, of course, is sort of, sort of uh, building on all of that sculpture that we're talking about. But more than that, the interior was more a statement of HMI, actually. So. What we were inspired by was this idea of uh, the car kind of uh, reading your mind as opposed to thinking for you. So as an example, we, we loaded the car with uh, eye tracking and, mo and, and gesture control so that you had a, a row of icons that were displayed on the heads up. And then it'll cuss for the driver. And basically <laughs> what happened was we had a couple of uh, eye trackers that would, would register your eyes, calibrate your eyes. Know who you're looking at when you say those things. Well, you know, it's just this kind of thing where you want to sort of let the car understand where you want to go. It's sort of reading your mind. And so if you're the, the, the eyes are the windows to the soul kind of approach to the HMI mm -hmm. system. So it simplified the whole, the whole get up in the interior. So basically you would select with your eyes and then you would adjust with your hand in space out in front of you here. So it kind of had a very natural sort of way that you communicated with the car, much like the way people communicate with one another. Lawrence talked about when his uh, studio was doing the cars that we saw, that it wasn't the only one. There are other studios who are at work on the same thing. And at some level, that's competitive, right, um, for all of your studios. On something like this that is meant to, and I don't mean to downplay it, but to merely amplify a car that's already, that's already tooled, basically, right? Is there still a, 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 cl a company-wide global competition like that? Or is it just, hey, you guys in California are clever and we gave you a nice big building, let's see something come out of it? Oh, I don't know about that. I mean, it's really, <laughs> the, the, the car came out of the studio and the, the production- Were others working on it? Did you have to compete for this, for this show car? No. Okay. 
So it was just, we think you ought to do this and... No, they thought it was appropriate because of the same designers who had worked on the production car got were it. involved with the, the development of the concept. So it's really boiling the essence out of the production car and understanding what are the bigger statements that we want to make with the car. And also with the interior, it was a, a chance to showcase our, our thinking with regard to, to new interface systems that were a bit more natural. So it was a nice platform for that to be able to show uh, the sort of next step that Hyundai wants to take with regard to luxury. Cool. We are at Warner Brothers, right? And th uh, this car is, is really important. Number one, it's a Southern California piece, um, as George Barris was in many ways a Southern California artist. Um, this is a Warner Brothers property, um, in, in other words, the, the Batmobile. And um, it's, a, it's a really long franchise, but this is literally a car that became a character. And at the time, perhaps, um, that series was a little bit tongue-in-cheek. Right? There were there were often cameos and other sort of wacky things included, but the car sort of became bigger than in in many ways bigger than bigger than the show and is probably more recognizable. Um, this is something that uniquely has happened for a long time in Southern California. We're at Warner Brothers. Um, only because I pick on him so often, the next one's a softball for Frank. Oh, thanks. Um, Look, your studio at 5350, is, it's sometimes called the North Hollywood City for GM, has very often um, been a liaison to the entertainment industry here. Um, I don't think this is, I think the car in the rear here is, is, is your that movie was, car? That was the first generation Bumblebee, and then this was a, actually a, one of our Camaro models that actually you could buy a Transformers Bumblebee car. Which, and so we're going to talk uh, later about how we put persona on onto cars project that this is a car that was also a character yeah you know a camaro was an icon to begin with but it was like you know it was a great tool for us to take um this icon and bumblebee you know being a hero and bringing it to a lot younger generation because that was kind of the sweet spot for the movie so you know all those bumblebee toys floating around it's like people know what a camaro is i mean i grew up with them my first car was a 67 camaro but you know, there's a whole other generation that maybe has an experience. And what do you as a studio do differently when you embark on designing an actual car that is an actual character? Well, you know, for us is, again, it's a little bit of working back and forth with the production team and the art director, especially in the last car. We did T4, uh, the Camaro in it, and um, we worked together with the, the studio, Michael Bay and, and, his, and his art director to do it. And a lot of it was based around it had to be a transformer, had to, you know, and they had specific needs as far as what the face, especially because that turned into end up being the chest plate and then part of the face. And, uh, you know, it, it's it, it's very much the same process. In fact, that car is not the next generation Camaro and it's not this generation Camaro. It's its own. It, it was strictly, I mean, basically the doors, part of the door was changed. And the roof, which is it an everything else is new. Like Chris talked about, though, is it an amplification of a theme you were already pursuing? Yeah. Or is it just what the so. movie people needed? No, it was very much an ampli amplification of it because it was supposed to be a character. And, you know, we're always surprised they build these things. And we don't always have the ability to build a, uh, the cars. The first two generations, we didn't. They were built by prop houses almost. So you get scared that they're not the quality of a concept vehicle, but on film you don't see it. It's like, really? And uh, they'll, the last, we'll, last they'll be airbrushing all of us tonight too, frankly. <laughs> <laughs> but the last cars were built by Aria, so uh, the the harder part of that movie was the Sonics. We didn't have rally cars. So okay. We had to build them in a little over two months. Good fun. Um, I want to move to talking about um, the persona of cars, and we're going to pick on three subjects tonight if we do this right. And the oh wait, something else snuck in. Somebody else has had. Not, not fair. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody else has had Jim. entertainment properties. Jim. Right? Um, is there anything we ought to know about this? Well, it's just a, a wonderful little fun celebration of the, the 10th anniversary of the, of the comic strip, actually. So they asked us, because we were uh, heavily involved, I guess, with the sponsorship of the, of the whole Walking Dead sort of. Thing. So, so uh, zombies were asked us to demographic. They asked us to do a little, uh, <laughs> little thing there. Sorry. They, of course, they asked Volvo first because Volvo actually qualifies as the Walking Dead, yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> oh man! Ooh. All right. Wait, wow. Where, where's the? Uh, where's, so, where's Volvo's Walter, not using car lab. Where's Walter White's Pontiac Aztec? There, there are yeah. many cars, <laughs> okay. right? There are many cars. That's what I was hoping um, for. Right. 
No, of the, of the three personas that I, that I want to dig into now, um, the first is, is cute. And uh, we put the word up just as a reminder that we're, or a signal that we're going to move into this category. Um, it's a, the car itself is iconic, but was often described in its first generation and probably in its rebirth as cute. What I want to do, though, is get each of you as a, as a master of your craft to talk about what is it about the language of the car that is communicating that. To me, you know, you look at a car like this or, or VW Beetle or whatever, so much of it focuses in on the face of the car, the eyes of the car, the mouth of the car. You know, that to me immediately says cute. That, and then couple that with, in this case, a, a scale, a certain scale, the combination of those things to me really immediately pegs it as cute. Okay. You know. Lorenz? Yeah, I think one of the next to face, and uh, I think proportion is a is a massive uh, topic. I mean, look at the scale of the car next to these uh, lovely ladies. I mean, this is enormous, right? This is uh, the tiniest little thing that you can imagine in the world. And in the end of the day, what I find very interesting as well, this is uh, the origin to this proportion is uh, actually use and a deep thought about efficiency and um, how can you do things differently actually to make them more affordable and more accessible for a wider audience and so on. So the deeper reason I think uh, behind uh, these concepts you also see and in, in this case it ended up with a motive that tends to be understood as being childish from a facial standpoint and uh, from a proportion tiny. And e even though that may not have been an objective for it to be perceived as cute. I think it's it's authentically designed simply. You see the, the true intent from an engineer that had a true vision around how to make a small car affordable that is accessible for a wider group of audience. Mm -hmm. uh, Topolino. Well put, Frank. Yeah, you know, the, the last car, just before we go off, and I'll, I'll keep moving, is that, you know, the nice thing about the Mini and was that, as Lawrence mentioned, the architecture was driven by efficiency, which kind of gave it its stance. And its stance with the small 10 inch wheels, it couldn't help but be cute. Mm -hmm. you know. And I think the Topolino shares the same thing. It's almost, <coughs> it's, a, it's a small car, but with very formal lines of the day. Yeah. So it can't help but be a, almost a caricature of what you know, big cars were. So scale alone is making this cute. Yeah. You know, that, it's, just, it's missing just the mustache, you know, it's kind of, so. That to me perfectly contrasts the Mini too, yeah. like what you were saying. The Mini is is not worried about what other cars are doing. Mm -hmm. It's just a solution to its objective. Mm -hmm. Where I totally agree. This this to me feels like a larger car scaled down. And so maybe the cuteness factor is a little a little less evident, but it's still somehow a caricature and bigger so when you see this car in person it takes on a completely different dynamic because you realize you don't realize looking at this picture how tiny that car is you know and that it wanted to be a gasser basically yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> later i mean also true statement to me this is another example where a design is born out of a use concept someone had a brilliant idea uh, about what to do after world war ii with uh, three instead of four wheels and a package that is so minimal that this can be produced in two days and is affordable to a wide group of people. A, a question on that. Th so this came out of post-war austerity, as did many of the revolutionary designs of the, of the last century. In, in post-war Europe at the time, was this considered cute or was this austere? It was functional, you know, like the yeah. Duchevaux was the same way. I mean, it was built for French yeah. farmers. Yeah, and it, it, it's quirky, so is this, but it's based around the idea that they were designing, solving a design problem that was based around needs. And, uh, yeah. and that can I still be cute. I don't Chris? know if they were even designed. Yeah. You know, like Isigonos is yeah. with the Mini, I mean, he's an engineer, yeah. and he's yeah. just look, thinking about ways of, of preserving space as much as possible. So words like stance or cute mm -hmm. or anything like that were never part of his, their, their intention, and I would, I would imagine the same thing here. We're talking about, you know, transportation, really. S solving the problem, but not, still not about the, the extension of my personality as yeah. I'm going down the road. They're still designed in that they take on all of the, some of the form cues mm -hmm. and some of the, the, the detail treatments of the time, you yeah. know what I mean? They didn't, they didn't have to follow that, they, yeah. but they chose to, you know I mean? Well, this is a headlight off of a motorbike or something. Yeah. Right, right, yeah. but. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
but the hinge mechanism off it's like brilliant yeah you know, it's just mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Uh, same thing Fra frank has informed us this is a, a mexican production beetle because of the lamps i think <coughs> In the bumpers. But in any case, it's broadly a first-gen Beetle in its sort of later years, um, a car that was often and probably to this day is described as cute. Um, it, it scale though is a lot bigger, guys. This is much bigger than those other mm -hmm. cars. Yeah. How is it still cute? Well, first of all, this car is heavily stylized. You know, I mean, this to me, this car takes on a ton of the streamlining styling from the time from the '30s when it was yeah, conceived. Absolutely. So there's. That, you know, to me, that this is kind of different than the Mini or the Isetta in that it's it's clearly been, have been heavily stylized. You know, they borrowed a lot from DKW, Absolutely. you know, which came before, and uh, but again, it, it's uh, some of it was the scale and some of it was uh, based around the function that you know we're going to build an inexpensive car. Was it cute know? in its day, or did it come back to be cute later? I, in this country, the thing was looked on as ugly, yeah. and they knew it. <laughs> you know? well, if you look at some of the old like uh, adverts from the 60s or whatever, when they said in 1949 we sold two of these things, and by 1969 there was two and a half million of them on the roads. You know, the, the thing, but they, they they compared it to like the the lunar rover. You know, we know it's ugly, but it gets you there. <laughs> you know, and. And but at they, some they point, had a, they, had a, they had a they had a viewpoint of themselves as as understanding who they were in terms of serious engineers yeah. and car makers. But at the same time, they had a bit of a sense of humor and a <laughs> bit of a lighthearted approach to the way they were they were perceived by the public, especially in this country. To me, though, the reaction to this car in this country was about contrast. You know what I mean? Because we didn't we didn't need cars like this at the time. There was, you know, the, the couldn't be more different the approach to vehicle design. There was not austerity here, you mean? Right. So you're looking at something like this when, when, in contrast to what's on the road here, it's immediately you're like, oh my God, that's silly, you know. But it becomes one of those things that becomes endearing, due to its due to, due to its function, you know. Again, it has that uh, old man. Yeah. <laughs> it almost has that mustache if you yeah. look at it long enough. <laughs> um, yeah, for me, this car is you know, again. It's 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 just the Italian version of the Mini in some ways. It's it, it again functional. It was a you know car that was relatively inexpensive, and and again it it, it in in some ways almost more romantic to me. Mm -hmm. You know, it had a little bit of romance to it. Mm -hmm. So and again, what, you left the people in the background, which kind of sets the stage. Sure. Would would a car this scale be considered romantic today? Hmm. <laughs> I don't know. That's a good question. I think most people would say it, they, they. I think there's a. It depends where you are in Europe. Most definitely, I think you can. Yeah. But we talked about the Twingo. Challenged. We talked about some of the other cars. We're scale challenged. Immediately, yeah. we react yeah. to if a car's too small, yeah. and we don't have to have that out of economic necessity. We we react to it. That's that's why small cars struggle in this country. And, and a lot of these cars were you even know. family cars when they were. Yeah, yeah. That, that was a family down dirt yeah. roads. Like a Ducheville is like an off-road vehicle in yeah. France. That's because that was the need. That was yeah, the need. Exactly. And then these, you know, VW, you know, Beetles, they came over here and naturally turned into Baja bugs. Yeah. A lot of my friends, your friends, probably had those things driving around. It was a natural so, yeah. transition yeah. Into, a, into a car that could, you could take into the desert. Yeah. <laughs> ah, Nash. Uh, wow. Not probably a sales success. No. But everyone remembers it. Why? Just a little old lady from Pasadena drives this thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Nostalgia, instantaneous nostalgia. All right. Yeah. Oh. Hey. Hey. Um, that, Do you want me to spend an hour now speaking? We're, now we're no. Gonna, I know, really, <laughs> look, just look, it up for him. But we just changed up because this is a sports car. And by, by brand, <laughs> a relatively serious sports car. But I think undeniably <laughs> cute and would have been described as so in its day. So how, how does that get pulled off? Cute and a serious sports car. I wonder if it is it cute or is it simple? It's a very simple, honest design. I think the thing that, and again too, they always call it the, uh, the thumbnail uh, lights on it, kind mm. of maybe gave it that uh, cuteness. And all Lotuses, I can say this because I own four of them, are basically kit cars, so there was there they weren't <laughs> always that taken that seriously. So You're here tonight, so you didn't you drive that, that <laughs> <laughs> up front. Yeah. Um, uh, smart. Yeah. yeah. Well, 
Is it, it, first of all, look, what we wanted to show was something that, that apparently was also born of need, right? Uh, and function, but is modern. Is this car cute, or is this just what was necessary? I think this is all cars in, that stand in the context of, of the time. I mean, uh, this comes from an age where there were super clear initiatives around the customer needs to be uh, talked to in a very individualized way. And these cars with these uh, panels that were interchangeable, not this generation obviously, but uh, um, the, the previous ones um, did that, right? They, they communicated a certain amount of lifestyle, probably very similar to uh, lifestyle to that of the, the, the Cinquecento actually, mm -hmm. something that you use every day in an in a easy and practical way and you have fun with it as well. So can, can Cute be successful today? I think Nowadays, we have different problems to solve. Okay. I don't think that Qt is a driver for any of the solutions that we would be looking for right now. I think we have a lot more serious issues to tackle that are related to infrastructure problem, how does individual mobility tie into mass mobility, what do we do with uh, CO2 emissions, um, which speaks to light white actually in different form factors? What do we do with customer groups that do not want to own cars anymore, but they want to have access to cars, access to mobility, right? Mm -hmm. uh, where this is a burden actually in, in Tokyo, there is um, enough understanding that uh, people are connected in a different way. They don't need to move around physically and they don't need to, need to move around in cars. So. You know, I think there's drivers uh, in the meantime that are, are... So we don't need cute. Well, it, I, I think for me it's that, you know, the, the new generation of Mini, the new generation of Cinquecento, those cars, I think, uh, are memorable. So they have character. Mm. But I think we do need cars with character. And but I they're think, less cute. Well, yeah. I mean, Derek, you're, the new Miata is less cute than the last one. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that's the intention. It was deliberate. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think, you know... I, that was really kind of about, in a way, kind of updating the car, bringing in a more a modern paradigm to the car. So is a modern paradigm one in which cute doesn't sell? Do we buy cute toasters anymore? Will we buy cute cars? I, I personally think that currently and kind of the current path is people aren't looking for cute in their cars. And of course, it depends on what the where, what brand we're talking about. It depends on what, where you're talking about in the world. Like in Japan, they have a higher tolerance for cute, cute and cuddly. Yeah, they have anime on the trash cans. As you yeah. might exactly. <laughs> All right. as you might imagine. Where here, you know, you, I feel like people want a car that has a certain presence, has a certain yeah. attitude, and confidence. Even if it's a small car, like a like a 500 or a Mini, mm -hmm. those cars look very confident despite their relative size. Mm. To, to other vehicles on the road. Even a Twingo today looks serious. Absolutely. Um, speaking of serious, let's move to Mean. Um, and these are just some images I'd like you to respond to. It's a, this is obviously an Aston Martin. Um, what is it about this that makes it look mean to us? I mean, a car can't really be mean, right? But we would certainly say that this car looks mean. Really? I think it's the expression of cool. Yeah? I All right. I don't necessarily see it as mean. Go. Well, I mean, you know, you're going to talk about maybe, a, you know, a hood scoop or a, an outlet on the side fender or something, but I don't really see, like, if I begin with the expression of the car, um, I see it as just, first of all, beautiful, mm. you know, in its proportions, unique in its graphics, uh, wonderfully brilliant in its, in its material. But who's more likely to step out, Twiggy or the Grim Reaper? But I, but I don't see it as, <laughs> yeah, but I don't see it as all being, like, you know, necessarily aggressive. All right. I see it as being, you know, sporty lively, etc. I, I would have said it's more masculine than maybe me. We got right. this car in our studio. What's that? Really? Yeah, one of our modelers owns this thing. Yeah. yeah. Christine. All right. Well, the, the movie character was certainly mean, mm. but the car was not changed much really, right? No. Why was it a good choice for that? Crickets, I don't know. What? Yeah, that's a... I think it was more the storyline that made it mean. So. Mean or not? Mean? No. I mean, you know, I mean, I think you have to, you know, decide, you know, on the face of the car if the thing is like looking pissed off mm -hmm. at you. You know what I mean? This, this says machine to me, actually. Mm -hmm. You know, it says, 
It's like a, it's like a shark is, a, is an eating machine. It doesn't have necessarily an angry look at, on its face. That's just, you know, it's not like going, you know, it's pissed off. Frank, were Mako's mean? They were Mako show cars. Were they mean? Yeah. Um, I, that, wasn't the, that wasn't the goal that I believe in the day. You know, I, I don't think that's what Mitchell was working towards. I think he... Is it what Shinoda would have been working towards? I think they wanted something that represented, you know, the speed of a shark and the, you know, that the, the you know, muscularity of the shark, that it had that feeling to it. You know, I don't know if necessarily is a mean a character you'd be selling. But, you know, just to go back to the, to the Mustang. We'll the get to end. one that's mean, maybe. Yeah. These, these, <laughs> to me, these guys, like especially this, is obviously decidedly more aggressive and more, you know, I mean, this is also born out of the, the function and, there was a design brief for this car that wasn't necessarily <laughs> intended for French farmers. <laughs> but, you know, even the Mustang, I feel like you've got to put it in the context of the time. Yeah. It, if you looked at other family vehicles or um, in the case of the, the Mustang, if you looked at European sports cars at the time, it was definitely more aggressive. And I think mm -hmm. compared to everything else at the time, yeah, it, you could call it mean. But what is it that tells us that? I mean, we know this car, so we know it's large, but if you, if you remove the person and you couldn't scale it, it still looks mean. It looked mean as a Hot Wheel. What is it that does that? What communicates that? And Chris, if it's not mean, if it's a purposeful machine. No, I mean, it's I'll, aggressive, for sure. Okay, all right. You have to separate, you know, when it's mean. All right. It has a certain, you know, attitude that it has something personal against you. It's you came from BMWs, and I think their, their language has tended toward perhaps the aggressive. Is that right? Um, I wouldn't say that necessarily. I think they've steered clear of that and they've, they prefer to use other words like assertive. But I think like with a shark, it's, it's got this intent. Yeah. It's this machine quality. It's an eating machine swimming about the water. This is a, a driving machine about ready to go anywhere it pleases, right? But it's not necessarily taking it out on you in a personal way with its expression or whatever. It's got, a, it's got an expression in the sheet metal and the roll cage and the Purpose. size of the wheels or whatever that tell you please move over, otherwise I will run you over. But it's, right. not, like, it's not like, you know, oh, I, I, I always hated your mother and <laughs> <laughs> take this personal. Mean, aggressive. All right. You know, but, then it, but you say that, but then it, how many times you go, oh, look at that thing, it's badass. Yeah. What Chris doesn't saying? talk like that. Of course he does. I've oh, heard him. <laughs> Ten minutes I mean, ago he was. That's badass, you know? So what does that mean when you say that? Lawrence, Europeans don't speak like that. Sure they do. <laughs> you say that that's necessary. <laughs> no, it's a I, tough problem. I agree with, uh, with Chris very much, actually. The, uh, uh, I mean, the, I wouldn't look at any of these cars as, as being mean. They have a, a different notion if they're um, a, bit, uh, a bit older in time, then they, they have a cool factor. Mm. But I, I would challenge you to find a Raptor owner that wouldn't describe his or her own vehicle as mean. I mean, I think that's pretty overt. At some point, that's overt. Yeah. I mean, I, I think Ram has been pursuing mean for three generations, right? Even under German ownership, Ram pursued mean, right? What, 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 first of all, what makes this mean? I mean, we know the capabilities, but what's mean about this? What's aggressive about it, Chris, besides running over living stuff? Because it's a foot and a half off the ground, maybe, yeah. to start with. <laughs> it just looks so capable. All know? right. Yeah, no, it's, 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 it's fantastic. The car is, yeah. is wonderful in terms of uh, giving you a visual, a visual cue as to its purpose built, yeah. you know. A lot, um, in a lot but of the, extreme proportion. But the Cinquecento yeah. was purpose built. Yeah. So I don't accept that as a complete definition of what makes a vehicle aggressive. But, you, you know, can't. like the Rambo Lambo thing, that was, again, it was, it was, a, it was a cartoon almost because it was extreme proportions All right. to it. This is uh, 82 this inches wide or something. Yeah, this verges on the same thing. Yeah. And, and again, every owner that buys it only puts a bigger lift kit and bigger wheels on it. So, Well, yeah, <laughs> if you think like a basic F-150 is already kind of muscular and capable mm -hmm. looking, and then you got the mid-level is a little more muscular. And so this is muscle on top of muscle on top of muscle. So, of course, it just looks like Steroid it's... Steroid edition. Yeah, yeah, this is like a the, 909 like cage or, fight, yeah, right? Yeah, 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 absolutely. All right. Um, futuristic. <laughs> I think this car, I think this was a Ken Gross find for a recent show, but it's, this car was done in the 40s as a vision of the future. The, what I would ask you, gentlemen, is when will that future arrive? <laughs> you just never know. 
<laughs> Did you see the movie Brazil? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Frank's a little twisted. Um, yeah. Lorenz, I mean, th this, uh, this car came out of um, Europe during the war, as unfortunate as that was. But it's a shape that we continue to see reiterated, right? What about it looked futuristic then, and why is it still so compelling to us as a vision of the future? I think there is a certain amount of naiveness with uh, the look. Mm -hmm. This is a real dream. Someone who said, well, the, if bubbles would float on half wheels potentially, this could be a look. And so it's a, it's a very simplistic approach to um, what design can tell. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so again, to me, futuristic more in a sense of, of naive. It's a utopia uh, mm. that is. I almost happening. don't believe that there should be a steering wheel on that thing. Yeah. You know, when I look at the, that picture and then that steering column with the steering wheel on it. If you ran into it, anything, you'd be wishing there weren't, It looks right? like a, like a <laughs> the first version of the Google. Yeah. 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 All right. Um, the, uh, I think it's the Buick Y job. My job. Yeah. Um, it, the first, I, th I think officially the first show car. Is that, could we all agree on that? Yeah. Considered first concept vehicle, yeah. Did it set the definition of how cars are supposed to look if they're futuristic? I think for the air it did, you know, it, and again, too, I don't think all concept cars should look like... We don't light. hide lights anymore, and we don't hide package, and we don't smooth out things that otherwise shouldn't be smooth. You know, I think Lawrence was getting into it. It's, it's kind of the, uh, the dream quality of concept vehicles, and, you know, that you're, you're trying to sell, I think, what it, whatever possibility when you're trying to do a future concept. You're selling a, a dream, or you're selling a, telling a story of what could be the future. Mm. So what's the old saying is that how, what's the best way to predict the future? Design it. So, you know, that's kind of what concept cars are really about. Nice. Ah, we know. Yeah. We found out what this was. That car's so cool. <laughs> well. Stiletto. We saw stilettos walking around amongst the show cars not yeah. long ago. Um, what, ab what about this? Why, why does this, again, say futuristic immediately? Is it, is it the lack of package and ingress, egress? And no, I think it's, it's, it's still, you know, this residual kind of thing left over for when, from when people were really dreaming, to be honest. When you, when do we dream less really now dream, as a society? I do think so. Yep. I do absolutely think that we dream less. Um, when, I'm, when I'm around, um, if I have a chance to get around students, I, I ask them, what are you dreaming about? You know, and it's kind of blank stares for a while and then maybe it's uh, you know I don't know their iPhone or something electronic or a mm -hmm. game or whatever um, but this is still still coming from the era of you know going to other planets and, yeah. and things like that and I, I think that the big point there is it's not just about what designers are dreaming about it's the collective populace the culture we're yeah. completely yeah. more open to what that could be, what the future could be, you know? And I think there was more of is, broader... Is that about. more constrained today than the era that generated a car like this? Yeah, the, you know, this was, you know, we talked about this. So this was the, during the uh, era of uh, the Italian Pininfarina and Bertoni basically one-upping each other. Mm -hmm. Modelo, Strato's uh, Zero. Um, Architecture. Yeah, I mean, this was... Uh, the great, like I, I told you, the great story about this is that they did this and they hid this from Lancia, and they were they were really wanted to steal um, Lancia as a client, Bertoni, and uh, uh, he drove the old man drove this to Lancia, and he pulls up to the guard gate, and this thing fit underneath the turnstile, so he pulls through it, so it's like, yeah, you know, and it was built off on of HF Fulvia, mm -hmm. so it it was a big dream, and it it drove, you know, I mean, this is one of those cars that. You know, everybody should have uh, spend a lot of time around. Yeah. <laughs> it was great. A different future. Yeah. It, it, a different a future that didn't happen. It's a beautiful design, but it's a future that didn't happen. But how different is this from Y job? Lawrence, is it right back to this is a dream? I don't know. I think many of of these these cars are also coming from a time where there were smaller teams of dedicated people that all shared the same vision. And in our complexity these days, there is so many people that have diverse interests that are, uh, you know, far apart from uh, leading into a same direction. There is marketing people that look at this differently than uh, engineers, than designers, than. 
uh, people that deal with organization and whatever else, the uh, production. And um, I think uh, the sharedness of, um, of a vision, of a dream, you see in a lot of these uh, cars that come from an earlier time. There's also mostly people that were educated in, in many different uh, disciplines in the same time. And engineering, the designer, was the same person from a tenant. Mm. So and in some cases, in, in, in this case with Jason Hill, in some ways we still had that. Um, but somehow as a society we didn't adopt. Um, <laughs> well? Hmm, there it is. I, I, in private conversations yeah. with at least one of no. you, there was a claim that this was this maybe just a, st <laughs> a stocking horse. A stocking horse. Right? In other words, let's put something out so unbelievably unattractive that we, that we, that we, we get them off our trail. Until we come out with what we're really going to come out with, which which actually might sell, is that what this is? Could I be. find this very consequent. Actually, if you're Google, then you do not want to make cars. You want to present something that is much closer to your original off offering, which is simplicity and interactivity and interaction overall. And this is what this says. So it deviates from all ideas that that classic car design or classic design is, um, is about. Uh, it, it's supposed to be very different and to me this is a very strong notion of actually of being quite ugly because I cannot connect it to any of my ideas around that's, that's what's challenge. beautiful. Is it a redo of the 41 bubble car that we looked at at the beginning of this little segment? I think it's intentionally different. This is not supposed to be a car. Hmm. But was the Jetsons car much different than this? I, I don't know. I, and again, and uh, it, just because it is non-automotive doesn't mean it has to be ugly. I, mean, I don't know. You know what I mean? It's a product. You know, a product can be and as a product. I don't think this is extremely attractive. I think the notion of autonomous driving is amazing, yeah. and I think that you know the the concept is is greater than what this design is. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, you could have been consequent like they have and still adhered to some fundamental golden proportions. Mm. And then it, then it could have gelled a lot better, and I think people would have. I, I think it's challenging when you try to do something new, not in one area, not in two areas, but every area of the car. Mm -hmm. The proportion's radically new. The graphics are radically new. The materials and everything is new about it. And people look at it and go, it's hideous. You know? If, if you at least had some classic quality to the proportion and the stance of it, but everything else was radically new, at least you'd have something you could grasp onto and say, this, that's kind of cool. This you aside, know? should companies like Google be changing automotive design? Absolutely. Sure. I think it's going to push the OEMs, the big companies, Absolutely. to change. They will. What's interesting about the autonomous car to me is that once you remove <coughs> the, the driving aspect, mm. I, I wonder about the design. Like, if, if somebody's going to be seen inside something that they are not operating, okay, what's the point? of design. Mm -hmm. It actually kind of puts all our jobs kind of like in question in a way, but it's really like if you could imagine a, a Porsche 911 going down the street without a steering wheel and you're not allowed to drive it. You're asleep or on your laptop. It, why does it look that way? It's why should it look that way? It's no longer an extension of my personality because I want to drive it, but since I can't drive it anymore, it shouldn't look that way. But isn't it still curb appeal, just like your house? Yeah, absolutely. Even if you're just rolling down the street looking good. I think you, exactly. I think you, should, ha you should have that, but yeah. it's like, are, are you trying to say something about yourself that you're no longer operating this thing anymore? Right. I think that's a huge component to the autonomous question. Um, and again, you know, we've worked quite a bit on autonomous stuff, and it's like it gets past what the aesthetic of the look of the vehicles, and, and, and again, it's the function, and it really is the function of all, the, all that downtime. What do you do yeah. with it, and how do you you know, address it. And then, you know, the, the crazy thing about this one was that they had no steering wheel, no pedals. And I just, I'm like, man, liability, <laughs> just is crazy. Why would, why would you do that? You, you want to have something, I think, initially they'll find that, that people are going to want something they can it, have If you really of. weren't operating, would you still sit rod upright in the equivalent of a padded church pew? Do you no. have to? No. <laughs> no, you don't have to. Uh -huh. you, could be, you could be in a beanbag lounge, as <laughs> long as these things don't hit each other. Yeah. So. W would that we could solve it all. We've got a tremendous audience here, and we will have a tremendous, aud a tremendous audience on video as well, so this will live on. Could we give them a big thanks? Again, I want to thank uh, the panel, Eric, and especially John Grafman for all of his work to make this event happen.